or higher of the field will be within this red circle here and within the, within the iron, just like this thing sucked up all the flux lines in here. Now, if there's any leakage flux, it's very small and it's mostly around the primary coil and it would be probably less than 1%. So almost all our magnetic field is within the red iron core in this case. Now the problem exists is if the field is within the red iron core, no field line touches the secondary winding because the winding is not within the iron. The winding is external to the iron. Now, if no field line touches the coil, secondary winding, then no voltage or current will be generated in the secondary winding. Now, albeit physics has devised a bunch of cute little things that supposedly make this work. However, there is no flux line touches the secondary winding. So if no flux line touches the winding, it cannot induce a current, it cannot induce a voltage. So how does it work? And that is the question you might be able to answer. You can. Yeah, well, all right, fine. <laughs> but there's no flux. Now, the, the one answer you're probably going to give is if flux passes through a coil that generates current, that's fine. But there's no flux line touches a wire here, which means there's no interaction between the core itself and the wire itself, which means what is interacting here. Truth of the matter is we have no idea how a transformer works, even though they're the most common thing around. There are many explanations, but I've never seen one that would, uh, Eric has pointed this out to me, that really explains this properly. So, I have uh, a few electrostatic experiments over there, and my next talk, my favorite subject is electrostatics, and I'm not, this is kind of off my uh, normal topics, but uh, the next lecture I give will probably be on electrostatics, which is very interesting because we ignore them completely. We're all uh, in tune with magnetic stuff and magnets and coils and wire, but nobody ever looks at the electrostatic force, which is where all the action is, and that's where the longitudinal wave interacts. Anyway, that's really all I have, and uh, I'd like to thank you all for putting up with us tonight, and I uh, wish you would invite Eric back sometime because he can go on, like I say, for about five hours here. Thank you very much. Tesla uh, experiments. These are uh, Mr. Wimsers invented this machine. This is what I call a dielectric induction machine. And I picked up that wording from Eric because uh, the explanation of how this thing works is also not especially clear. The discs do not touch. The discs do not touch. There is uh, uh, two grounding electrodes on each side and they're counter-rotating discs. <clears throat> yet, as you can see, they generate quite nicely. The generation portion we really don't understand too well, although there's a lot of explanations for this thing, but none of which I'm satisfied with. Then the other side of it is an electrostatic motor, which I don't know if any of you all have seen one of these things, but I have a three-foot diameter electrostatic machine, and it works this thing a lot better than the little one here. But I, we just had so much stuff tonight, and we had an hour, so I decided we're just going to do this one. But uh, these machines are interesting. They use no magnets. They have brushes. Uh, they seem to work best with uh, glass epoxy, of all things, seems to be the best thing that works. What you're doing is... Uh, how to let Eric explain the thing actually, but the, the glass epoxy of the di of the rotating dielectric is a thing where the field lines of the ether essentially are attaching to pieces of that dielectric, and when it, when they counter rotate spin, one of them generates one half the thing generates the other half generates the opposite charge. It's uh, I could get into a lengthy discussion of how the thing works, but it's not really. 
uh, I don't think it's correct. So, <laughs> uh, the, uh, but, but they do perform quite admirably. Everybody thinks that or the sun. A lot of confusion resulted. It's found that the sun transmits no transverse electromagnetic energy whatsoever. The only thing you can see in space is reflected when the longitudinal field strike a surface and turn into the scattering transverse electromagnetic waves. So what they did in favor for the astronauts is put in the special diffraction gratings on the windows so they could be convinced that they were really somewhere and not nowhere. <laughs> And again, the practicality is for the 160 meter and 80 meter people, this is really the only way to go. And you'll find with these type of systems is they really don't use any energy. Your plate current would be practically nothing, for those of you that know what tubes are. Or even know how radio works anymore. I know that's starting to get forgotten. I know there's only a few WAs and WBs around here, and there's one uh, N6, probably can transmit 35, 40 words a minute. <laughs> Any other, yeah. Is there any practical application of this actually in use in the world today? Uh, I think it's all pretty much lost and gone. After 1919 and the closure and seizure of all of the Marconi stations, that was pretty much the end of it. And Tesla clammed up and became a total recluse, and all of his funding was cut off. Not so. <laughs> Who continued his funding? We have somebody here that knows what Tesla did after 1919. I'm curious. I'll bring the book to you. There was like court cases. Oh, there was always court cases. And this is quite likely explanations. Tesla was involved in a, a court case where he was fighting for the survival of his Wharton Cliff Tower. And the... Uh, I would, what would you say, the depositions or whatever, I don't know the legal terms of that court case, were recently published by a person by the name of Leland Anderson, which apparently is a competent electrical engineer. And when you read through this, you see Tesla saying over and over and over again that his radio was non-electromagnetic, repeatedly, but it all fell on deaf ears. Once physicists grabbed a hold of electricity, all knowledge of it ceased. Electrons have nothing to do with the flow of electricity. Electrons are the rate at which electricity is destroyed. Electrons are the resistance. The waveform of electron flow is the same waveform produced when you slam on the brakes and you hear that horrible screeching sound. It's not a nice harmonic sine wave. It's a very bitter, horrible sound of energy dissipation and material flying everywhere. Electricity flows in the space between the wires. This has always been known by electrical engineers. For example, you short out a major electrical circuit, you will see the cables violently repel each other as the electromagnetic force tries to escape from the boundaries in which they're contained between the so-called bounding conductors. But most people are not electrical engineers and don't deal with the situation. I have to deal with it every day. I had a welder run away on me at work a couple of days ago, and every wire and every conduit tried like hell to escape the conduit. The noise was horrible. Everything repelled. Everything rattled. All the lights flashed, and all the computers failed. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Bruce De Palma did not invent the end machine. The end machine was invented by some people that lived in the bushes over the hill. And they, and they actually produced, it's called a sunburst, uh, I'm not that familiar, but I know Bruce De Palma. Uh, Bruce De Palma picked up on the idea and tried to duplicate it and produced a very wonderful constant current machine with horribly strong magnetic fields. It still did not produce the free energy.